Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jeremy Hafner, Chancellor here at the University of Denver. It's my honor to welcome all the parents of our future students and our transfer students and our continuing students here on a town hall meeting, which will hopefully answer many of your questions and um, tell you and convince you how excited we are to have your students joining us um, this fall. I want to personally thank the parents that uh, um, are with us right now and simply say that we are so honored that you have entrusted not only the educational future of your students, um, but also the well being of your students. We know that these are very anxious times unusual times and the fact that you're willing to trust your um, health of your student with us means a great deal to us and we will be talking about uh, that and what all the plans that we have in just a few moments. I see we're still um, coming on board um, but I thought I'd say a few words uh, to get us started. We, we have a panel uh, and I'll introduce them in just a moment and I think you'll find that the the questions we're going to ask the panel to get us started are hopefully a, to address many of your own questions, but we'll also have time for you to answer, ask any questions of all of us. You know, the University of Denver has always focused on helping students um, meet the moment, right? To build the lives that they desire and improve the world. Right now, uh, at this moment, this is one that no one could ever have predicted, of course. But I will submit to you all that um, in order to best thrive a student in this midst of a global pandemic, what they need is what DU has always and will continue to provide and foster while they're here at the University of Denver. A world-class education with incredibly dedicated professors health and safety first and foremost, but also promoting a sense of well-being and wellness while they're here at the university. And most importantly, a unique experience for the whole student that will give them new skills, additional skills for them to use in a very complex world when they graduate. It's these kind of North Stars world-class education, health, safety, and wellness, and an incredible college experience that the panel and I are going to discuss with you all today. But it's also important to keep in mind that the university is not only using those as our North Star, the university has a strategic plan and a, and a direction by which they'll move towards those North Stars. And while I won't share great details of the strategic direction that we're headed, I am really excited to talk about one in particular, and that's the student experience, because I believe this is really important to you all as parents. After all, I'm a parent of a college going student, and I know how important that student experience is for him. And that is we're really reinventing the notion of the student experience, really trying to address the whole student. And by that, I mean, of course, we mean the intellectual development of our students, but we also want to really address the professional development, the notion of the well being and making sure that they're equipped to really not only handle the stresses of a pandemic that's facing them today, but whatever stresses face them in the future, a sense of resiliency. And lastly, a real commitment to explore and encourage what character is all about. The notion of resiliency again, but also responsibility and respect. We're literally reinventing the student experience and it starts with three beautiful new buildings that are going to be opening up on campus here uh, in the next several months. Two of which are already going to be open by the time your student arrives. One is a brand new residence hall. Another one is a brand new uh, center for career achievement where they'll explore their professional development. And the last one is a brand new student union, a community commons. So this is all about 
connections, collaboration, and community. We are so excited about the experience that your student will have here at the University of Denver, and we're committed to really making sure that it adds value to the overall educational experience at the university. Now, these are very complex moments. They're historic moments in many respects, and it's vital that the university continues to pursue its bold vision of being a private university dedicated to the public good. Your student will find many examples of this once they're on campus. They'll find it in our clinics that we offer in our uh, professional psychology uh, programs, or they'll find it in our um, service learning programs that we offer here where students get an opportunity to work with nonprofit organizations in the community, close working with faculty to really make an impact and help improve the welfare of the lives of our community members. There's so many ways that we are really making good on our vision to become dedicated to the public good. And we're excited to have your student join us for that reason. Now, together, we're going to make this not only a, a, an experience for your student on the short term, navigating a fall term that will look different than we've ever expected, but also making sure that they navigate for the long term, building meaningful careers and having these lives of purpose. I hope that in today's town hall meeting, you'll, you'll get a better understanding of the university's commitment to these very fundamental ideals and actually see how we're putting them into action in so many different ways. Let me take an opportunity now to introduce our panelists as you'll find them, I think, very engaging, filled with great answers and, and uh, solutions to the challenges that we face. First is Mary Clark, our brand new provost and executive vice chancellor here at the University of Denver. Leslie Brunelli, senior vice chancellor for business and financial affairs. Dr. Sarah Watamora, our COVID response coordinator and a professor in the Department of Psychology. Michael Lafar, our executive director for DU's Health and Counseling Center. Dr. Nikki Latino, interim vice chancellor for student affairs and inclusive excellence. And Dr. Tom, uh, Professor Tom Romero, uh, I guess he is a doctor as well, uh, interim vice chancellor for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Now this panel is going to focus on high level questions today but we also have individuals in behind the scenes answering your questions in the Q&A section here in the Zoom environment. And we will have um, at the end of the hour also time to answer some of those questions very live. So without further ado, let's get started. I'm gonna start with, um, with Mary Clark, our provost. Um, and the question is really about the kinds of courses and modalities that our students will experience. There's four of them, in-person, high flex, hybrid, and online. Could you talk a, a bit us about these um, modalities? What will, it, what will a student experience in each of these modalities? And what are their options to put together a really robust fall quarter schedule for them? Sure, I'm pleased to, and thank you for the question, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, so as the Chancellor just highlighted, there are four modalities of instruction this fall. Face-to-face -face is what we traditionally understand as face-to-face, -face, students and faculty in the classroom together, albeit socially distanced, and so the classrooms have been reconfigured so that all participants are at least six feet apart. Uh, desks have been marked out uh, if they're not appropriate for use. Uh, likewise, all participants in the class must wear face coverings. Uh, there will also be uh, wipes and uh, hand sanitizer provided uh, for all participants in the face-to-face -face class at the entry point to the classroom. So I just mentioned that by way of assuring you uh, that significant planning has gone into the face-to-face -face, uh, modality in terms of promoting the health and safety of our students and our faculty. In addition to face-to-face, -face, uh, there's hybrid, uh, as the chancellor mentioned. That is where uh, faculty uh, in a given course will instruct uh, some of those sessions in person 
and then some instruction will be provided uh, in an online modality. Uh, you may have heard the term a flipped classroom where there is some work that is done online and then more discussion conducted face to face uh, that reflects the hybrid model that we have. High flex is where we are intentionally integrating both our face to face students and our students who are learning uh, remotely, which is to say online. Uh, so a faculty member in a high flex class would be abiding by all the face to face protocols that I just spoke of face covering and the social distancing the hand sanitizer and otherwise. Um, the faculty member would be up at the front of the class as we uh, conceive of it. Uh, with a monitor uh, and a microphone uh, that enables the faculty member to be simultaneously in uh, communication with students who are learning remotely. Because of the complexity of the faculty member integrating both the in-person and the remote students, uh, these classes are being supported by specially trained student assistants who will particularly oversee uh, the participation, the integration into the classroom of the students learning remotely. Uh, and so a number of faculty have determined uh, that they'll have both the face-to-face -face students and the remote students together on a Zoom screen so that they can see one another. Some will be present in the classroom, some will be remote. Uh, that's high flex. And then the last modality is the online instruction, uh, which is where the instruction will be exclusively provided online. It may be uh, synchronous, which means that all participants in the class will be present at the same time, the faculty member and the students, or it may be asynchronous, uh, which means that the faculty member will be recording content, a video, a PowerPoint presentation, a whatever it might be, a lab experiment, uh, and then sharing that content uh, with students so that they can be um, observing the lecture or the content uh, at their own time and pace. That's asynchronous, not all at the same time. Uh, online courses will likely have a combination of uh, the synchronous and the asynchronous. Uh, in terms of how students learn about the modality of their coursework, uh, that has all been indicated on the academic schedule through the registrar's page. Uh, as of July 15th, all courses were noted as to their modality. A student who has questions or concerns about the modality of their instruction should be in touch with their academic advisor uh, to ask whether there are any alternatives or just to learn more about what is planned. Happy to entertain other questions in the q and I'm afraid you're on mute. <laughs> ah, mute. Uh my apologies. Thank you, Mary. I'm sure there will be plenty of conversations and other questions on the academic experience in just a moment. Um, looking at the Q&A, I see lots and lots of questions, very understandably, about um, the preparations and discussions we are um, thinking about the virus itself on campus. How is, it in, how is it impacting our planning? Looking at what other institutions are, are doing and making pivots to online in a variety of, of ways. Uh, many of those questions are being answered off uh, behind the scenes, but I thought I'd turn to Sarah Watermora, who is our COVID response coordinator. Um, Sarah, you know, the virus is very dynamic. We're seeing lots of universities um, take different approaches now. So help the audience understand what we're doing to monitor changes in the local spread. What indicators are we using? And how are we making decisions about the, the various different modes of operation that we're going to be in, uh, including the one that we're planning right now, which is of course online learning. So just talk to the audience in general of, about all the work that you're doing and all of us are doing to think about different um, scenarios moving forward. I'm happy to, Chancellor. Um, so we will be shortly in the next few days uh, sharing more information with the broader community about these factors. So please stay tuned for uh, the ability to dive into this and in more depth. 
But broadly speaking, um, because we have a late start, we have the advantage of watching our peers. So we have watched all the things our peers have done. Um, we have carefully evaluated, um, being sure we have put in place every proactive measure that, that we have learned about. So we're doing proactive testing, quarantine, symptom monitoring, um, a number of different uh, adaptations across campus to our facilities, um, lots of those types of things that are preemptive uh, moves. And then we are watching, we are daily tracking the schools that are opening. So we're tracking uh, close to 50 schools daily, watching uh, their dashboards to see what's happening. Um, questions about off-campus activities, on-campus activities. We are providing uh, lots of opportunities for students to have social, uh, social activities on campus safely. We are educating our community about the dangers of off-campus activities, and that's included in the Canvas course, which is uh, required. So the situation, for example, that happened at Notre Dame, um, where as of yesterday, they had 408 cases all stemming from a single uh, house party. That's something we're using as an educational tool for the community. Um, and we will continue to adopt daily. We will have um, measures uh, that we are tracking about our on-campus population, which will include uh, the positivity rate, so the number of positive tests as compared to the number of tests we run, um, our ability to support isolation and quarantine, the availability of personal protective equipment and testing supply, and then conditions in Denver and Colorado, which we are tracking daily and will be updating on a dashboard. Thank you, Sarah. I'm sure there will be other questions along the way. There's some questions about um, how other universities have made the decision and a lot of them coming from those off-campus parties. I will say that the university will be sending out um, a more detailed instruction to our students indicating the importance and of their responsibility in uh, following our protocols and also giving them a, a good strong sense of what happens if those protocols aren't followed and their responsibilities in that. And with that in mind, I'm going to ask Nikki Latino, you know, um, can you talk a little bit about more about the educational process that's going on and what the honor code really does say in terms of our, our students behavior following those protocols as well. Absolutely. Thank you, Chancellor. And good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to our incoming families and students and to your lifelong community. I'm so glad to be here with you. Um, as the Chancellor said, we are doing holistic education because we want our students to make informed decisions. And so that has come, as uh, Sarah mentioned, in the form of the Canvas course that students are taking now in peer-to-peer -peer education. Our student leaders are really um, stepping up with their responsibility and their care for their peers and the leadership that they're providing to help educate on this new behavior that we're all learning. And we're also, through our health promotion, really sharing information about the risk associated with each behavior because we want our students to make informed decisions. And you can still have meaningful connections. You can still socialize. You just need to follow the safety precautions that we put in place for you and that we're educating you about. What we're noticing and witnessing nationwide is that students are deliberately um, disregarding the protocols and the safety measures, and that's what's causing the issues. And so we're just not going to tolerate that intentional disregard. We are educating, we are providing information, but if there's an intentional disregard, we will move swiftly. Um, and that can come in the form of an interim suspension, which also um, has a trespass to campus connected to it, and then a referral to student rights and responsibilities for the rest of the conduct process. And if found responsible, students could be facing temporary or permanent removal from the university for housing or, or building restrictions, and then additional interventions such as training. But the intentional disregard for the protocols and safeties puts our entire community at risk, and we will deal with that very swiftly um, through that process. So Nick, I'm glad you explained that, but now how are the kids going to have any fun in all this? Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Because, you know, the, having some fun and having some development opportunities is at the heart of the DU experience as well. So let's Absolutely. talk about that. Absolutely, Chancellor. And yes, our students, you will still be able to have lots of fun. We have a hundred, over a hundred student organizations who are planning virtually engaging opportunities for you and small in-person activities that you'll be able to engage with. 
in our resident for our students living in our fraternity and sorority home uh, fraternity and sorority houses and in our residence halls the residence teams and the FSL teams are doing the same thing. There's gonna be very engaging virtual and in-person activities. We are utilizing our outdoor spaces and our fall beautiful weather that we have. You know, we'll have things like comedy shows, we'll have silent disco, we'll have opportunities to connect in smaller groups, we'll have movie nights. We will be able to provide a lot of activities just with new protocols in place and um, with our students following just wearing your face coverings and the social distance and the health and safety. But we have um, planned for you a, a vibrant co-curricular experience that is both virtually engaging and um, on-campus experiences. And students can learn about all that's available to you through Crimson Connect. And that is um, our student engagement platform. And for our students living in the residence hall, you can learn about all the activities available to you through Rafter which is the system that we use to communicate in the residence halls as well. Perfect. Thank you, Dickie. Um, and we're gonna stay on the theme of um, the, the student experience just a little bit longer. So this one, next question's for uh, Michael Lafar, Executive Director of the Health Counseling Center. Um, we know that in this um, pandemic that depression and anxiety um, has risen for, well, frankly, all of us, but especially for today's um, college students. Um, we are living in a world that is incredibly demanding. The news is often overwhelming, um, and our students really um, are sharing the brunt of the anxiety that is around them on that regard. Um, so we do believe at the University of Denver, mental health is incredibly important. It's, it's a key part of our commitment to the well-being of our students, one of our four dimensions that we're uh, especially focused in on. And I know that we offer several services that our students can take advantage of um, for their health and, and support. So Michael, why don't you talk a little bit um, about those support services that are available and maybe how the student can get access to them. Thank you, Chancellor. Yes, I'd be happy to do that. You know, and I also want to talk about one sort of philosophical underpinning before I discuss the specific, um, the specific services that are available, which is here at DU, we really see the relationships and the personal attention as a really important piece. So this idea of connection to one another, sort of why we struggle with this idea of social distancing. We really like to call it physical distancing because we want people to have meaningful, connected relationships. So that's why faculty are so, um, have developed relationships from day one with students. And we want students to have that opportunity to connect um, with one another. So that is kind of the foundation, which is really important for us. And, and it's part of the, um, what folks should expect that they get here. Um, so yeah, we think being, finding your, your, your connection, making relationships with one another is essential to the DU experience. And it's true that, that we can lean on one another and connect with one another. So I think the students living on campus will find that certainly with their, their develop, that relationship with their RA, they'll find those opportunities to connect with one another. Um, for those folks who do need uh, some additional supports, we've got wonderful um, services here, uh, counseling services available here in the Counseling Center. We are um, doing most of those services through Zoom, but um, the medical team is also has a social worker embedded right in, so folks are feeling like they're not quite sure, is my insomnia more about um, some mental health struggles that I'm going with or more that we've got? even embedded into the medical team, we've got, they're very psychologically minded to help people navigate um, these experiences. So the university takes a multi-level approach to catch uh, issues early and so that we can intervene before student, before issues become bigger. We've got a great SOS office, a group of case managers that can, are connected with faculty. If students aren't performing well or are struggling in the classroom, we can support them that way. Our, our goal is to intervene before things be, get too big, and that's the DU way. Great. Thank you, Michael. You know, um, questions on um, the university having to pivot. Of course, um, our plan and our expectation is to open up uh, and have classes start in the fall quarter. Um, we are already having very successful classes 
um, for our law school, which began last week. But of course, uh, as Sarah Watamora mentioned, we are constantly monitoring and um, taking into a variety of indicators into account of what we need to do just in case uh, we have to make a change in those plans. Um, so this question is really for Leslie Brunelli. Um, as we think about the possibility that we might have to go back to an online environment or partially online learning, um, you know, many people assume that an online environment saves university and college considerable amount of money. But I think the truth is really quite opposite of that. So Leslie, can you talk briefly about how DU has invested significantly into both technology and training to make sure that our students get the DU experience that they really are expecting from the university this fall? Absolutely, Chancellor, thank you for that question. Um, you know, we plan for and support instructional teaching methodologies, even in a non-COVID world. And also we put dollars towards our classroom technology every year. But in this budget situation, we made a very thoughtful plan to add additional funding to this in an era where we are reducing budgets across the institution. This was a strategic initiative and therefore we put almost $5 million towards both the instructional atmosphere and our, our technology. Um, one of the more interesting things that I think that we are doing on the academic side is not only enhancing the, the number of instructional designers and the mentoring opportunities that are available for our faculty to um, support their, their teaching in a high flex way or an online way, um, but we're also adding um, a group of around 80 individuals who are classroom assistants who will participate in the online world and in the high flex world during the class and help support that. Much like we have folks on behind the scenes today in this Zoom room, there are people behind the scenes who will monitor the Q&A, monitor the chat, and assist live with technology issues so that the class can perform smoothly. Um, that's a new compliment this year. These are not teaching assistants that we're used to who help grade and that type of thing. These are folks who will simply be here to help us all with the online experience and make sure that the technology is functioning as we know it needs to. And of course, we've put additional funding into our actual technology, the backbone of our system, our IT infrastructure, the individuals who will help all of our campus succeed in this platform. Thank you, Leslie. So the next question is uh, for Tom Romero. Um, you know, the university is deeply, deeply committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, we see this as the right thing to do. We also see it as the future. Um, our students are going to be graduating into a world um, that is far more diverse than uh, what I experienced um, as a student here and helping them really uh, acquire the kinds of skills and experiences they need to succeed in, in that world means a real strong dedication to diversity, equity, and inclusion here at the university. It's our commitment on so many different ways. Uh, we're taking a lot of action to really move us forward um, with these efforts. And this month we shared a draft plan uh, with the campus community and the key stakeholders. So Tom, can you share with the audience some of those broad strokes of the plan and why is this so vital um, for our community members uh, to be aware of? Great, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today and for, for those of you that are taking time out of your lunch hour to, to join us. Um, I have a, um, I, I'm the, the parent of a, a, a student who graduated in the class of COVID-19 and will be starting uh, college in a couple weeks. So I share with all of you the, all the excitement and trepidation of, of, of this moment and uh, certainly um, welcome all the care and concern that, that you're asking us these great questions. Um, Dr. Latino has, has really done a great job for those of us around campus to talk about our current moment when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, we as a, a campus community, we as a society are not dealing just with, two, with one crisis, the, the COVID crisis, but we're dealing with a humanitarian one. Um, and this is the issue of systemic and institutional inequality and racism. Um, and, and all of those ways that, that difference um, is, is magnified uh, to, to, to really sort of to, to create inequality and inequities you know, among so many of those among us. As, as Chancellor Hafner indicated, the University of Denver, one of the exciting things about 
about students joining the University of Denver is the opportunity to learn skills, uh, to learn a language, to become sophisticated in how to deal with these larger questions of difference, larger questions of equity, larger questions of inequality. As Chancellor Anthony talked about, we have a plan um, in terms of our, our larger commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, 14 items that are connected to all the ways that the University of Denver, um, our students, our faculty, our staff, our alumni, uh, those that are connected with the university, engage um, deeply with issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I want to share three that I think are going to be really important for, for our students in, in particular. Uh, the first part, or the, the first uh, of one of these action items is the ways that we as a community can come to have a shared language and a shared understanding about, about what diversity, equity, and inclusion means. As many of you know, uh, these terms are contested. Uh, these terms aren't consistently used. Um, and so we really, as a university, want to be deliberate about making sure that all of us at the campus are thinking about these terms and using these terms in, in, um, in, in ways in which we, we can build a shared community around this. I think most importantly, this is not some sort of box, box checking, but there are opportunities to engage in deep reflection about what this means and how to apply it um, in not just your, your daily life, but sort of beyond, beyond your time at the University of Denver. To this regard, a second initiative that we have planned for the year and one that certainly um, has come up um, exponentially in terms of requests to our office in the diversity of equity and inclusion is what is the university doing around questions of anti-racism? So we, as, as part of our, uh, our initiatives, are gonna be uh, hosting a whole series of conversations about what is anti-racism? What does it mean? What does it look like for me as an individual? What does it look like for us at the University of Denver? So we hope to engage in, in this real important conversation around what this work is and what it means for us as members of the University of Denver. And the third initiative I wanna share with all of you is one that is tied to our, our, long, our larger sense of, of all the skills that all of us need at the University of Denver to deal with these issues. And so for the students in particular, um, we are going to be the only school in the country uh, that will have some specialized training uh, around these sorts of issues. And we're going to require, uh, over the course of the year, all of our faculty to engage in, in this training. We're, we're faculty Institute for Inclusive Teaching Practices. And as part of this training, our faculty will be able to design courses that are thinking about these issues. They'll be prepared to deal with tough questions that come up. Uh, either in a virtual environment or in an in-person environment or a hybrid environment about how to deal with these issues and in particularly how to prepare our students uh, to, to be leaders uh, uh, in, in engaging with these issues going forward. So those are three, I think, important initiatives I wanted to share with you today, um, but there's certainly a lot more that, that we have out there. There's a lot of exciting work that's going on around this at the University of Denver and we're excited to to participate and, and to collaborate with all of you on this. Right. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I'm gonna turn to Provost Clark again. Uh, Mary, you're also a parent of uh, a couple of first year students. Um, you know, as parents, um, sometimes we, we don't fully understand um, what the law, the FERPA law is all about. And I think this is a really important a topic that we can inform our parents that are on with us today and how important it is to have those conversations with our students to to let them know um, their role in waiving the FERPA uh, rights in that regard. So Mary, you want to talk a little bit about FERPA? Yes, thank you. And I'm very glad to talk about FERPA. And first, let me define it. It is the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act which indicates that educational records are in the domain or control of the students. And I'll return to that more in a moment. But as the chancellor just referenced, I am uh, the parent of two first year college students. Uh, each of my sons uh, is off to college uh, this fall. And I've had to have a conversation with them about well, if you expect me to pay your bill, uh, you will need to share uh, access uh, to the financial portal uh, with me. Uh, so that is an illustrative example of how FERPA works. Uh, the educational records, including bills, including transcripts uh, and other materials, 
are in the control or domain of the student. This is a federal law uh, that recognizes the student's rights. The student, your student, uh, can exercise uh, what's called a FERPA release form. Uh, it's also called a FERPA waiver, a FERPA consent form. All three of those are interchangeable release consent waiver to enable you uh, as their parent or caregiver to access uh, those records or to have a conversation with an individual um, who will talk with you uh, about those records. But the student is the gatekeeper uh, for those records or for those conversations. Uh, one situation in which uh, that is not applicable, of course, is an emergency situation involving the health or welfare of your student. Uh, in that situation, uh, campus officials would seek to reach you uh, ASAP about whatever situation uh, has arisen, and that does not necessitate uh, execution of a FERPA release consent or waiver. Uh, naturally, the health and welfare of your student uh, comes first. So happy, again, to entertain any further questions about FERPA. Thank you, Mary. I too did that, by the way, with my uh, sons. I said, if you want me to pay your bill, then you will sign the waiver so that I know what's going on. Yes. Um, this one, next one's back to Leslie. I want to hear, uh, well, I think the parents want to hear a little bit more about the facilities. What are we doing to, um, you know, be preventive in the um, exposure to the virus? How are we cleaning things and so forth? Also, I think there's an interest in um, any kind of outdoor spaces that we're going to be providing students for studying or having conversations or even office hours with our faculty. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, lots, lots to unpack there, but we've done, gone through a process of evaluating all of our classrooms and of course the residence halls and our dining facilities over the summer and determining what our spacing should be and, and actually have little bubble diagrams of all of these spaces to show where individuals can be and shouldn't be as we work through this process. Um, Mary mentioned in her discussion of re regarding the classrooms, we have taken things out of service. We have placed signs on items that are too close to others. That includes tables in our classrooms, chairs, but also in our dining areas and um, in our restroom facilities across the campus. So that, that work is ongoing and, and we, I feel like we've done a, a, an adequate job of, of monitoring that. What we've also done is look at our outdoor areas and added some additional seating um, for students to be able to uh, move around between classes or before or after campus. You know, obviously everyone's going to want to have a good Wi-Fi hotspot and we're making sure that those are available around our vicinity. And we've added some chairs that, that can be moved, but only within certain parameters of each other. That includes our Adirondack chairs everyone is familiar with if you've been on our campus. We've also added a, a, a number of others. We are looking at some additional um, outdoor spaces. Um, we have not invested in the tents as some institutions have um, to the degree that, that others have is that becomes an issue with us with our weather changing as the, we get further into the fall and into the winter. Um, also another um, significant undertaking for our facility staff this summer has been an evaluation of the ventilation in all of our facilities to make sure that we have fresh air in the, the facilities that support fresh air, but an evaluation of our entire HVAC system. And with the campuses of many buildings as we have more than 80 of 125 um, acres of, of land, you know, it's important that we make sure that um, we are providing um, appropriate ventilation and where we have been able to upgrade that, we are in the process of doing so, trying to keep ahead of the supply chain for that. Does that answer your question, Chancellor? It does indeed, very well, thank you very much. Um, so, you know, most of people know that uh, I'm a big fan of uh, uh, working out, gym, swimming, uh, running, and so forth. So. Um, Sarah Watamara, this is for you. When can students and parents uh, kind of think about when the gym and the pool will open? And these are marvelous facilities that the university has. We take great pride in the Ritchie Center. Um, so talk to us a little bit about what we're thinking in that regard. Sure, I'm happy to do that. We are very close to having final protocols. Um, we actually have the protocols all prepared to open uh, Ritchie and the pool. Uh, the pool in particular, or the Course Fitness Center and the pool, the pool in particular has been in use over the summer. Um, we've had 
our athletes there and uh, some summer camps. So we have a pretty good handle on how to, how to run that safely. Um, and then the course fitness center is following uh, fitness center guidelines. And uh, the final changes and adaptations to the protocol we've gone over with the Denver Department of Public Health and Environment to make sure that we're fully in compliance. And that's happening right now uh, between our legal team, uh, the athletics facilities, and uh, our, our colleagues at the, at the city. So we should have that available soon. And our intention is to have those open when our undergraduate population returns, if not sooner. That's great news. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so back to Nikki, because the next question is one um, about peer-to-peer -peer initiatives. Um, and couldn't agree more with this uh, question here. Are there any peer-to-peer -peer initiatives underway to help support the university's health and safety goals? Often students are the best ones to really influence each other. Um, I know from my personal um, conversations that I've had with uh, the leaders of our undergraduate student government or graduate student government, that um, student leaders are really stepping up in a variety of ways, whether they're athletes or they're in the fraternities and sororities, um, or they're just in student clubs. I've been terribly impressed at how they are very much vested in making sure that the university stays open by helping other students follow those protocols. Nikki, you wanna talk a little bit more about what um, Student Affairs is doing to really encourage that peer-to-peer -peer influence? Absolutely, and this starts also with Discoveries Orientation Leaders, where um, all of you will have an opportunity to meet your Discoveries Orientation Leader virtually in uh, next week, actually, to create some of that community. But from all of the groups that the Chancellor talked about, we've had more than 50 students who have engaged with the peer-to-peer um, education campaigns or planning with the fall opening and uh, they represent all different clubs and organizations and also we've had athletes who created their own video um, on creating awareness about why they're wearing face coverings why they're social distancing because they want to protect themselves each other the DU community and for us to be back together in person and, and stay together in person so that's really important so through the various groups that we have under student affairs, between our resident assistants and the residence halls, our student organization leaders, which there's over a hundred of them, Chancellor mentioned our USG and GSG, fraternity and sorority life leadership. We will continue to bring these leaders into the conversation and into the planning throughout the fall quarter, throughout the year, but they have been extremely engaged and care deeply about peers, making connections and helping with the education of this new behavior. Great. Nikki, stay online with us because there's some questions I think that are in the Q&A about dining and how are we going to help students, um, you know, get the food and nutrition that they need in a time when social physical distancing is important. And we have a brand new facility, the Community Commons, that is going to be, you know, really the pride and joy for student uh, activity when it comes to these uh, kinds of experiences, especially around dining. So talk to, talk to the parents a little bit about dining uh, opportunities. Absolutely, and thank you for that question. And part of physical wellness and that holistic approach to wellness is nutrition. And our Sodexo staff takes great um, care and providing um, support around understanding nutrition and the food, and they are, working really hard. They are following restaurant protocols and putting safety measures in place to have grab and go, uh, to have opportunities for students to sit inside and outside in partnership with our facilities so that they can um, still eat together, just socially distanced. And then we will have in our community commons a variety of opportunities um, and, and different food choices when that opens in the winter quarter. But Sodexo takes a holistic approach to nutrition and being able to provide opportunities for our students to have access um, to the food that is most, health, health, most healthy for them and options for that grab and go, go and that social distancing dining. Okay. Um, so the next question is, um, I think a question for Nikki and probably also for Mary. Um, and it's really um, about you know, some of the anxiety for uh, both students and parents in this time of move in and so forth. 
Um, usually this transition from high school to, uh, to higher education is one of celebration and the move-in date is a big piece of that. So, um, you know, can you talk a little bit about what parents can expect on the, on the move-in day and how, how, can, how can they help prepare and support their students in an appropriate way? So maybe let's hear from Mary first and then Nikki, if you don't mind, or Nikki and then Mary, what each one. I'll be happy to start. It'll be more on the meta level, and I think Nikki uh, can provide more of the uh, logistical guidance. So again, I'm the parent of two uh, soon-to-be freshmen, and I'll say that my sons have been experiencing some anxiety about this next step in their lives, but also tremendous excitement. And so my approach has been to support uh, both of those uh, emotions, both of those responses. Um, I remember the anxiety myself uh, of going off to somewhere new and meeting new people and new routines and having a roommate who had a nine foot penguin, <laughs> stuffed penguin in the room. Uh, however, I digress. Um, so the anxiety and the excitement. And I guess one thing that I uh, would share um, in terms of insight into what DU is like, I'm new in my role as provost and what attracted me most to the campus, I think is likely also what has attracted your student most to the campus uh, and it's twofold. One is the commitment to the public good. Uh, so DU is a great private university committed to the public good and that's uh, demonstrated through really all that we do uh, in the classroom, outside of the classroom, all of the student activities, community service and otherwise. Um, the second thing uh, that attracted me to DU was the joy that was quite palpable in my interview when I asked folks on the committee what did they like uh, best about DU and to a person they said working with the students or if it was a student who responded it was working with the faculty um, and so again I highlight that your student will be uh, coming into an environment uh, where our faculty truly love and take joy uh, from working with the students uh, and what a you know, special environment that is uh, to be in. So over to you, Nikki. Thank you, Mary. During orientation, our students will be able to um, get to know virtual through a virtual involvement fair, the various student organizations that are available to you. And if you have a great idea and there's not an organization, then start one. Uh, we'll help you do that. And um, but you'll have an opportunity to, to look at and connect in the way that feels most comfortable to you. And I think that's the hybrid model. Some of our students feel more comfortable engaging virtually before they engage in person. And so take an opportunity to engage in a way that feels most comfortable for you. During move-in, uh, you'll be able to meet your resident assistant. You'll be able to meet your neighbors. Um, and you'll have residential connection meetings starting the, the night that you move in. And so for move in, um, we've really put together, you know, with the safety and health measures, all of our first year students will have 90 minutes with their uh, two helpers. And if that's their family members to move in, um, we'll have people greeting you and welcoming you into uh, your residence hall. You'll have an opportunity to move in and then you can explore the campus and have time outside of the residence hall to really connect. But there'll be many of us there to welcome you and your students in um, and provide the type of experience that will help your students connect from the moment they step on campus. Great, thank you. And I am so looking forward to uh, move-in day and that week of um, kind of orientation just to get to know the students and see the excitement on their faces. Um, perhaps some of the sadness on the parents' faces as well, because I know it is uh, a difficult time for everyone on that one. But we are here to help you navigate through, um, through thick and thin in that case. Um, so uh, the next question is um, uh, probably best suited for um, Mary, again, and, and this is about um, really helping students benefit from remote learning. So uh, 
you know, the question is, there's been and continue to be challenges with remote learning. Some schools are revisiting whether to have final exams and instead looking at more targeted exams along the way. Um, this would enhance the learning um, in, in theory and reduce the challenges and stress uh, around remote learning. Um, Mary, what, I mean, I know that our faculty are deeply committed and thinking about uh, how to really best present the course if it is online. Um, talk to us a little bit about some of the uh, different strategies that you've heard about our faculty deploying um, for the benefit of the learning that our students will have. Certainly so. And so what you'll find is that uh, already in the spring semester uh, and quarter, we have both semesters and quarters, our faculty uh, were very thoughtful about assessment of learning outcomes, which is to say, did the students uh, take away from the course what it is the faculty member uh, designed or uh, intended uh, as the major takeaways and how best to assess that, whether it was through online exams, whether it was through written papers, uh, whether it was through some sort of oral assessment. And so our faculty, uh, again, are, um, as I indicated earlier, really devoted uh, to the learning uh, and the um, uh, you know, academic growth of our students. And so across the different uh, expertises that our faculty bring to bear, uh, they are determining what makes most sense uh, for um, assessing whether the uh, course has been um, effective in conveying those learning outcomes and how, uh, how the students uh, can engage best uh, with the faculty in demonstrating their mastery of those outcomes. So it'll very much uh, vary uh, by discipline and by school in which your uh, student is enrolled. And while you're talking about um, exams and the student learning outcomes, um, just help the rest of the audience members know what to expect at the end of the fall quarter. Um, you know, Thanksgiving comes, classes end, just uh, make sure everyone is on the same page about when finals are and how finals will be delivered. Right, so the finals will be online in order to enable uh, us to, again, uh, observe the best interests of health and safety of our students. Uh, and uh, they will uh, occur around that Thanksgiving uh, break. Um, but it is already determined that they will all be online, uh, again, to provide flexibility, uh, to our students and to uh, safeguard uh, as best as possible their interests in health and safety. Right. Thank you, Mary. Um, there are just two other questions in the chat that I see right now that um, have not been answered. Um, our team in the background is working um, incredibly diligently to answer as many questions as possible. Um, so these next two questions really are for the students that have chosen to be fully online and to not come on campus. What are we planning to do to help them feel engaged um, and that they feel connected, a sense of belonging? Um, maybe Nikki, this is a, a good question for you to kind of start with. Sure, thank you, Chancellor. All of our students who are joining us remotely this quarter, you will have an opportunity to participate in orientation and orientation activities. And then all of the virtual engagement that we have created that's in Crimson Connect, you have access to that. So we want you engaged. We want you um, taking advantage of the virtual programming and events and uh, student organization meetings that we have. But all of that information on the virtual engagement is also found in Crimson Connect, and we look forward to you joining us remotely. Great. Well, I will say that um, our team has been so successful at answering so many of your questions that um, we are almost out of all your questions. Oh, there's just one that popped in. Um, is my ID information the picture I submitted through the Pioneer web? I guess that one's already been answered on that one. Sarah Watermore, you want to just talk a little bit about the Pioneer ID uh, that we distribute? Sure, happy to. So we are um, uh, using badge access to um, make sure that it's uh, the only people in buildings are the buildings who need to be people who need to be in those buildings. So your ID card will give you access to the buildings where you have class. 
um, the dorm that you live in, the dining halls that would be relevant, um, the library, um, the university hall, which has admissions and financial aid and those kinds of things, um, and a few other uh, places where you might need to go. So you definitely need your ID card to be um, working. You should submit your picture online and then your ID card will be available at Discoveries. Uh, when you come to check in, your ID will be available for you to pick up. And then if something goes wrong with that process, we will also have uh, other ways that you can get your ID, including appointments available in that first couple of weeks. Fantastic. And I think with that, I, um, this is a uh, wonderful time to um, thank all of the panelists for participating in today's Town Hall and especially thank the parents um, who have signed on with us um, and have asked such engaging questions on this. We know that there will be more questions along the way and we will always be available to help answer your questions. And please look for more messages that will come out as we develop more of our plans um, in the next couple of weeks. Um, but I'll simply close by how excited we are to welcome your students back to the University of Denver campus. It has been lonely here without them. Uh, and I think the energy and the vitality that they bring um, lifts all of our spirits. Uh, we will protect the health and safety of them as our first and foremost principle. Um, but also important to us, of course, is their educational experience. And I hope that after today's town hall meeting, you've got a better sense of that commitment that we have. Thank you all for joining us and we wish you uh, just a terrific day. Thank you everyone.